Hello and welcome to Bobfest. You've all been waiting for it. Uh, we've been dying to share it with you. Uh, we are going to spend the entire weekend celebrating uh, and commemorating Band of Brothers. So we're going to be looking at the uh, TV series. We're going to be talking about the history behind it tonight. Uh, over the weekend, we're going to be talking to the Easy Kids. That's the families of the guys that were um, immortalised, if you like, on screen. And then we are having a cast reunion as well, which is basically mayhem. Um, but hilarious in places, uh, profound in others. Um, and again, we just can't wait to put it all out there so you can enjoy um, everything that we've been blessed with in the last couple of weeks recording this for you. So today we are going to talk about the history. Uh, we have Woody, Paul Woodage with us, who's World War II historian, guide, and uh, of course our Bobfest coordinator. He has essentially made all of this happen. Hey, Woody. Hiya. And hey, Mag, I know, I know your Mag is going to be sitting there as well and her little hand is going to come yeah, in and wave. <laughs> we also have James Holland, uh, with us, poster boy for World War II historian Ninning, uh, known for his TV work as well as being the author of many, many fine World War II books, including his latest, Normandy 44. Hi, James. Hello, how are you? All right, how's Wiltshire? <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit wet today, actually. Yeah, still hanging in there. Yeah, no, no, we're all fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we are thrilled as well to have with us John Orloff, who's the screenwriter um, behind episode two, Day of Days, and episode nine, Why We Fight, my two favourite episodes, um, along with number seven. Hey, John, how are you? You're in upstate New York. How's Corona lockdown? Very, uh, well, they, I, this is a, a better place to be locked down than a lot of other people in the city. I'm I'm in the country. I, I, I live 100 miles outside of the city, so... Uh, you know, it's it's intense here, but we're getting through it. Yeah, I think everyone just seems to be like, no one wants to complain because there's always someone worse off, but I think we all really yeah. just want it to be over now, don't we? Yeah, and I don't think it's going to be for a bit. Yeah, well, let's give everyone a diversion um, and talk about Band of Brothers, which is a subject yeah. that nobody ever, ever gets bored of. Um, oh, I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Lies. Okay, right, let's, let's just talk about the book first, um, because... We were talking about what, how we were going to start this program off and how we're not, we're not going to sit here and criticize everything that's wrong with Band of Brothers. What we really wanted to do was talk about the history, talk about how it came to the screen, um, and really discuss sort of why things don't come 100% accurate. I mean, there's a great Tom Hanks quote that, uh, Woody put out there, um, in another show that, um, basically said tom hanks said if you can take a hundred percent accurate in the script it, by the time you get it to screen it's at 30 percent you've done well so we just want to talk about that and talk about the process and what got dropped and what didn't um without just sitting here and nitpicking basically because that yeah, would be yeah, mean-spirited yeah. on something that everybody's sitting oh, no, in on this conference it's an loves. interesting process yeah. um and, and and things are not done willy-nilly although sometimes they are but but carry on. <laughs> Let's start with the book briefly. Let's just talk about Stephen Ambrose's book, which obviously led to the series. Um, to what extent, guys, is this the beginning of individual unit histories? Um, prior to him, there'd been regimental and divisional um, histories and autobiographies, but no one had, am I right in saying, James and Paul, that no one had taken a small group of men before and followed them through the war? No, I don't think, I don't think anyone had. I can't think of one. I mean... There's some brilliant books that came out in the 1960s um, and, and late 1950s. Obviously, there's Cornelius Ryan um, and his books, um, Longest Day and, and so on, um, and A British Too Far. And then there was a guy, there's a British guy called Richard Collier, who's an absolutely just brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, they're all they're, they're journalists in background, and they have this eye for um, eye, eye for the human stories. And I suppose even before them, the, you know, the the great one is Ernie Pyle who's the great American war correspondent. And he was the first person, he was the first journalist, really, to go around and, and talk from the bottom up. And so um, he was, you know, before the Second World War, he was he was going around the United States. Then he, and he's working with the Scripps Howard newspaper syndicate in the US. He then goes over to America, um, goes over to London in 1940, reports from the Blitz, then is in um, in Tunisia and, and Algeria in, in North Africa in 1942-43, Sicily, southern Italy, on D-Day, you know, he's one of a very small handful of, of journalists who comes over on D plus one. Um, eventually gets shot in Okinawa, right, you know, in, in, um, in, I think it's May, late April, May 1945, that he gets actually killed. Um, and, and he's just an amazing guy because 
you know, he tells it, he goes and meets people and he tells that kind of human story. Then you get the Cornelius Ryans, then you get Richard Collier. And what Richard Collier did, but I mean, his great book is Eagle Day, which is about the Battle of Britain. And what he does is he just goes and talks to zillions of veterans and people who've actually fought and lived through this and gets their eyewitness accounts. And so again, is telling it from the bottom up rather than from the top down. After that, in the 1960s, uh, and from once Cornelius Ryan goes, then there is a kind of a, a sort of solid return to the kind of 13 Brigade proceeded up the hill. That they were counterattacked, 90 mm. people dead, and then and then the Panzer attacked or whatever it might be. Uh, um, and that kind of, sort of quite dry kind of history. You could see that Stephen Ambrose is completely influenced by by Ernie Pyle, by Cornelius Ryan, and all this. Stuff. And what he's trying to do is 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 reconnect the Second World War to that bottom up from the guys who were actually doing the fighting, but but trying to inject a kind of a, a kind of I suppose a slightly greater kind of historical rigor to it, um, which I think has sort of been questioned a lot ever since he's he's been published. I mean, a lot of people kind of take him to pieces now for his research, but actually I think he was pretty good for the most part. And I I I think, you know, out of that came a kind of another new wave of, of history writing, which is sort of putting human drama and the experience of ordinary people in extraordinary situations, which is what World War II is all about. Um, to the forefront again. And, and that's certainly, you know, I've been very influenced by him and by all those guys I've just mentioned, you mm. know, in my own right. Paul, what do you think? I mean, to what, what influence has Ambrose and the show had on military authors since um, 92 when the book came out and then more significantly since um, the show was shown? Well, I think you have to address as well the timing of when Ambrose was speaking to these guys because it was the late 80s, 90s. So these the men who served... They were coming up for retirement age, so they still had all their faculties. They were still um, young enough to remember it, but they were also being a bit more reflective. Mm. And I think people who've been interviewed perhaps 20 years earlier, it was still very dry, still still very uh, matter of fact. And I think Ambrose made it comfortable for these men to be a bit more vulnerable and speak a little bit more about the suffering. I think that comes through in Band of Brothers. And, when, and later, with John explained with the show, you know, the likes of these guys saying, you know what, I was terrified. You know what, it was awful seeing my friend die. Because that stuff hadn't been addressed 20 and 30 years earlier. So I think Ambrose had this wonderful timing of catching them just when they were really sharp, but also um, wanting to talk more emotionally. And I think that's the debt we owe him. And as James said, He's perhaps not the greatest historian ever, but we owe him a debt of thanks for, for putting these people and making it okay to talk, maybe okay to be emotional. I think that's, that's the, that's the start. That's what he started off. Can I just jump in here, Alice? Cause I think of course. That, that's really interesting is, is the, what, what you tend to find after the Second World War is, is of course that everyone who's been involved in it, you, you know, they're just, they're just one of millions of others. So they don't see themselves as special and they very often never see themselves as anything particularly special. They just live through a time where that was what they had to do and they went through it and they answered the call and they did their bit for whatever. And, and then they get home and they get demobbed or, you know, um, go back into city life, go and do a college degree or get married, have kids or whatever. The kids are growing up in the fifties and sixties and they don't want to hear it banging on about the war every two minutes. You know, it's not until the next generation come along, the grandchildren start asking about it, about it and studying it at school. And it's not until, as, as Paul says, as Woody says, you know, where they're retired and they've actually got a bit of time to think about it. And quite often they haven't really thought about it since 1945. And then suddenly, you know, a letter comes through the post saying, you know, hey, we're having a bit of a reunion for the, for the, for the company or, or for the ship or for the squadron or whatever it might be. You know, do you fancy coming? And you sit there and you think about it and you think, oh yeah, I will go. And suddenly it all starts coming back and you're really chuffed to see your old mates and, and, and you start talking about it and start articulating it. And some, some people write, you know, then you come back from your weekend and you tell a few yarns to the grandkids and the grandkids and the kids say, you know what, you pops, you really should kind of write this down. And so they write a memoir or whatever. And then Ambrose comes along and starts picking their brains. And so there is a reason why in the kind of in the eight, late eighties and in the nineties that suddenly at that time where they're just getting to retirement age and beyond that they're starting to open up about this stuff. And also, if, if I could just add something twofold, you know, uh, Ambrose had already written the Eisenhower biography, which, which gave him a lot of credibility with the vets because that was the authorized biography of, of Ike, or it was an authorized biography of Ike. So that gave him a lot of street cred 
with with the guys. And then secondly, yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, and then secondly, you know, again, we can argue about his 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 methodology and quoting and all of that he had an incredible gift for language and conveying these stories in a really accessible way for for folk that didn't want to sit through william shire's you know thousand pages you know or whatever i think he's a really i think he's a brilliant writer and I, and you know i think it's i think it's 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 too easy a, a hit to kind of criticize him to be perfectly honest you know i mean he is he has shaped so much of our modern understanding of the second Agre- world war exactly because i, I agree and, and like, all the negatives are are offset by that fact totally 100% every, every single yeah. time and his books are you know even kind of 30 years on 25 years on they're still terrific reads whether you're reading that one or whether you're reading citizen soldiers or whatever it might be yeah yeah. Um, let's talk about how you get from a book which has far too much in it um, to put on screen and you get to the 10 episodes that we have. So, John, there was, the original treatment was 13 episodes. Can you tell us about that? I can tell you a little bit about yeah. it. Not, not a ton. You know, Band of Brothers w- w- was a very specific project with a very specific process that was very unique to it unlike other television programs or movies it was this weird hybrid process as you probably know now in this you know new world of tv we're all sort of much more aware of how it works and there's a showrunner and a writer's room and, and and we've all sort of been taught about that but that is not how band worked um, there was no writer's room. There was no real showrunner in, in any traditional sense. So, you know, what had happened was Tom and Stephen had, had made Saving Private Ryan. And uh, Tom, I think, had, had read Band of Brothers as a prep for it and thought it should it would make a, a, a really good miniseries as a follow-up. Stephen said yes. It went to HBO. It was sort of Tom's baby. So Tom hired a writer um, called Eric Genderson to read the book and to sort of break it up into episodes. And he was originally going to write the whole thing. And so after I had met Tom through however I had met Tom around this time. And I was, I'm a big World War II f- World War II fan and had said to Tom, you know, I, I hear you guys are writing, working on band. If you ever need a writer. And that's when he told me there was only going to be one writer. I don't know, about three months later, two months later, I was having a meeting with Tom and he uh, said, Hey, we're going to, we got to write this really fast. Do you want to write a couple episodes? And I'm like, well, yeah. And he said, do you want to write the D-Day episode? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so then I got that, notebook of 13 episodes um, that Eric had sort of uh, figured out. And I mean, I, 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 I don't even remember it. I mean, we kind of threw it out pretty quickly mm. just because a originally the D day episode, I think was episode three and it was still episode three when I was hired, but somewhere very quickly in the first few months of me working on it, HBO, I think it was HBO's call, said, this thing is getting pretty darn expensive. Uh, I think we need to trim it from 13 hours to 10. And so that created a whole very quick rejiggling of the structure of everything. And... um like I said, I mean, from that point forward, I never looked at that 13 episode thing again. So we don't need to cry ourselves to sleep at the thought that we lost three episodes of epicness. That was really early on. That was my one concern that somewhere there was this idea for another three incredible episodes that had been no. fully developed and suddenly got no. cut. And oh, okay. No, 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 no. Really early decision um, was made on it to, to cut it back to 10 episodes. I've watched Band of Brothers, you know, God, so many times. 
I really have. But I've, I've watched Day of Days. <laughs> I mean, I've watched that episode more than any other hour of telly ever. Yeah. Wow. 100%. I honestly, I, 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 I just think it's such a completely brilliant bit of television and it works on so many different levels. It, it just, you just absolutely nailed that. It is utterly compelling from the very first scene to the very last scene. And, 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 and the, and the, and the circular nature of it, the, the, the coming full circle of the day, I think is just done so, so deftly. It's, it's, it's absolutely sublime. Well, thank you. Interestingly, so so to sort of talk about process, in that 13-hour version, I'm pretty sure, as I remember, the D-Day episode was a whole bunch of guys experienced during D-Day. And like, right. so again, we were the writers. Eventually, there were five of us. It, it was just me and Eric, I think, and maybe Graham this first round. And so I was told to write that episode, D-Day, and we were given total free reign. You know, basically I could write whatever I wanted about Easy Company on D-Day as long as I sort of uh, uh, told Tom about it first. Sure. And so I said, well, I want to stay with with um, Dick the whole day. It's like D-Day through Dick Winter's point of view. And everybody thought that was a a good idea. And so I went off and and wrote it and I'm really proud of it. And I'm really proud that guys like you like it because I spent a lot of fucking time making (laughs) sure. But it just just works on every level. It really, really does. But I mean, I mean, specifically like, you know, uh, 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 I, I interviewed all the, you know, circa 99, I interviewed every living person who had who had fought the battle, you know, um, everybody. Compton, Winters, Lipton, Garnier. I can't go through the list because yeah. I'll mess it up. But eight or nine or to Malarkey. Um, and it was like all their notes, it was like Rashomon. You know, they all remembered it slightly differently. This happened over there. This happened then. Oh my God. That's the problem yeah. with, with, audio, with oral testimonies because you know because right. memory. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you deal with it all the time. So where did you start? You had a blank bit of paper, free reign from Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. What did what did what was the first thing that went down on the page? Um, well, I I didn't um, I didn't uh, uh, outline it. Uh, so I started from the beginning. Um, and originally, uh, the only real change to the script that was made from my first draft was, uh, the guys were singing in the planes, which they were really doing. And in my draft, when we open up with them on the planes, they're singing a song. I can't remember which one I, I chose, um, to boost morale. And then they kind of slowly drift out of it as the explosions are heard from Normandy, from the uh, flak guns. Um, but Tom didn't like that. Or I'm sorry, Stephen didn't like that. So we, we took out the singing. And um, yeah, and then I just wrote, I mean, I just wrote it in in chronological order. I made a map, you know, that I've, <laughs> I've, I've shown um, uh, to Paul. Um, and I just was really careful. I mean... I shot can't believe shot. like what James is saying. It just, it hits every point bang on and comes full circle that you didn't know where you were heading when you started writing it. That makes it even more impressive. Well, I knew he took <laughs> the guns out, you know, yeah. the final <laughs> couple of pages with him and Nixon, we definitely, that changed, you know, that evolved a little bit and trying to get the last line. I'm still not totally happy with the last line. Um, when he's talking about, you know, he wanted to spend the rest of his life um, on a farm in peace, which is true. And, and that's from one of his letters, I think, mm. but I just don't like how it, it came out. But, um, well, I think you're being a bit hard on yourself. I thought it was great. I love that bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, when you're, when you're watching something, you're not, you're not thinking, you know, as, as a punter, you're just watching it and you're, you're just enjoying it or not enjoying it. And you're not analyzing why you're enjoying it or not enjoying it half the time as well. But you know, a lot of it is about showing, not telling. 
Um, there's a yeah. whole lot of, sort of tricks of the trade when you're screenwriting. You know, it's, it's, it's a complicated process. Everything has to have a, there has to be a reason for every scene, every moment, every second, every word has to have thought and reason and, and a point to it. And that is why good screenwriting is really good screenwriting because all those things just come naturally and you as a punter just absorb them and take them on board. But, and I, and I think most people just have no idea how, how complex a process screenwriting is and, and, you know, it's true. Most people that don't. Must be, you, you know, of, of all the people in the world who have favorite favorite second world World War Two films and TV series, I, I would I would put a very very high guess that that is the most watched hour of World War Two telly ever made. And you know, that's because you nailed it. Yeah. Thank you. That's really that kind of makes me humble. <laughs> I agree. Um, I just have to say. So first of all. Um, the fact that you there were multiple writers to me doesn't show. Did you collaborate at all um, to where you were going? Surprisingly little. Um, you know, I uh, was living in Los Angeles. One of the other writers was living in Los Angeles. One writer was living in Carmel, California. Another one was living in the on a houseboat in San Francisco. Uh, and then another person was living in Paris. Um, so we were only in the same room together one single time, and we were almost all done writing by that point. It was kind of a, a, a pointless meeting. So, um, no, we talked to each other surprisingly little. And, and I think when we come to the, the mistakes of, of band, uh, some of those mistakes will be because – of of not quite enough coordination, maybe. I mean, I like think... Webster speaking in German, then not speaking German, then speaking German again. <laughs> Correct. That is completely because of us not talking to each other. Completely. Talking to the German baker. Um, and it can, it, the way they ended up cutting it, it plays either way. Maybe he understands it, maybe he doesn't. So I, I'd like to get a pass on that one. <laughs> Um, so let's get to, you've already mentioned the singing, um, and you've already mentioned the word mistake. People assume if something is not exactly as it is in history, in a TV or a film, that it's because you got it wrong. But that's not the case. You knew they sang in that aeroplane. You put it in the script, but it just, Steven Spielberg looks at it and said, doesn't feel right. They should all be right. quiet and reflective and that. How do you balance accurate history with storytelling? Well, that, I, I mean, there is no easy answer to that. Um, you just start as accurate as you can and then you start, you start from the, the most start accurate. compromising. Yeah, you, you start from the most accurate. And, and I, I personally, as a screenwriter, tend to try to be as accurate as humanly possible and figure out the drama around those accurate events. Mm. Um, but not all writers, you know, different writers do it differently. And I mean, we're, we're I'm, I'm, de- I'm dealing with it today. After this call, I'll be having a very similar conversation about whether we should be doing something historically accurate in Masters of the Air or whether we should deviate from a historical event and, and why should we do that. Um, so... It's always a complicated dance. In episode two specifically, I I was trying to get it as truthfully as humanly possible. Um, uh, Episode nine, again, I can only talk about it from a personal standpoint. Yeah. Episode nine is much less historically accurate, partially out of necessity, partially out of um, an idea that it was an opportunity to have a larger conversation about the war. So uh, the necessity of it was that most of the guys did not want to talk about Dachau and Landisburg. Uh, they weren't actually the very first people there, but even that was confusing in 1999 to get from them. Yeah. It was very hard in 1999, pre-internet. I mean, that's why there are the Blythe mistake. I mean, a lot of these mistakes are because it's pre-internet and very hard to double check a lot of these things. So anyway, episode nine, uh, you know, the guys just did not want to talk about discovering the concentration camp. 
You know, mm-hmm. they, they would not talk about it. So that even to Ambrose, you know, it's only a couple paragraphs in the book mm-hmm. of their personal experiences at Landsberg. So most of them wouldn't talk to me. I finally got Winter's Wood, um, but even that was kind of minimal. Um, and so how do you convey the Holocaust in an hour where the men have only told me it was really, really bad? Yeah. I mean, we've spoken to the actors. We'll get to episode nine. Paul, tell us about episode two. Um, you mentioned in your notes a bayonet duel that didn't make it in and that, but what kind of things are we looking at um, that weren't able to be worked into the one hour, um, which, which as far as I think everybody on this conference is concerned, is pretty much a perfect hour of television. No one's That's saying, it. well, but it didn't have this and it didn't have this, but, but what is missing from a historical context? The only little things are that it only shows although deliberately a few men, and you've got men of the Easy Company who are fighting in St. Mary Glees with the 82nd Airborne, their story couldn't be told. You've got Harry Welsh and his movement towards the drop zone that couldn't be told. Uh, but, you know, you can't, you can't tell the story of 140 guys, so you mm. have to focus on one, one story. Um, it's just that there's this legendary story of, of Bull Randleman landing in St. Mary Glees and having a bayonet duel in a garden with a, with a, with a German. And there's this, this idea that that was filmed or it was there at one point, but it was dropped because he ends up having the bayonet duel in the barn in Holland and they didn't want to do it twice. But that's the only story. I mean, I would love to have seen it on screen because, you know, a bayonet duel in San Marie what, you know, what's not to like, quoted James there. You know, what's not to like about that? But it's, it's a perfect hour of telly. But, you know, yes, when I'm telling people about the real battlefields, I say, yes, of course, there were other events the company were involved in. There's a big context of other events, other objectives other gun batteries that all happen, happening simultaneously. But that is to not uh, criticise the episode. It's just it has to only be what it can be. But, yes, there's a wider story that wasn't told. I, I think the point here, is, and this is what people need to understand, is, is the moment you start filming something, you are largely fictionalising it. You know, it, it, is, it, is, it is a depiction of something that happened. It is not the truth. It is not reality. And necessarily, because of screen time, you're condensing things that took hours, days, into a matter of minutes. And so you're constantly distorting stuff, and there's no way around that. And I think one of the good things about, um, one of the really good things about um, Band of Brothers, where it really works, is the language, because the language feels really authentic. And I think that's one of the things, one of the key things for me that I'm always kind of looking out for when I watch stuff, uh, period, period TV or period films, is you want to get us, you want to feel that the, the, the dialogue is, is real, that, that you're getting a taste of what it must have been like. And, and for me, that's the problem with Fury. I don't believe that that tank crew would have talked to each other in the way that they do, quite apart from the kind of ludicrous final denouement on the crossroads. I mean, clearly you just call in close air support. You don't just sit there waiting to be shot up by a bunch of SS on their feet, but that's another story. But, I, but I do think, you know, one of the good things about, about TV and film and whether it's Band of Brothers or Saving Private Ryan or Fury or, or any of these is, you know, you hope that this generates interest in the subject matter and, and, and in that kind of immense human drama that is, that is World War II. And you hope that that prompts people to kind of read about it and look into it and research it a little bit, a little bit more and realize what is, what is accurate and what isn't accurate. What is, what is sort of a little bit disheartening sometimes is, is that, you know, you see the opening scene of, of Saving Private Ryan and for all its brilliance, it's not indicative of the experience of everyone on, on D-Day, let alone everyone on Omaha Beach. It's, it's, it's one moment in time. Uh, and again, it, it, Hollywood has this incredible power to distort our, our narrative of the Second World War, which is where you know, the responsibility you have, John, really comes in and, and why I'm so kind of heartened by what you say about the kind of the, the efforts you go to, to to make it as accurate as possible. And I do think that, you know, by and large, you know, Band of Brothers gets it so on the money co- co- compared to the vast majority of stuff. I mean, people kind of constantly saying, you know, what's the most accurate war film? What's the most inaccurate war film? And I always say, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, one, one of the most accurate of all the recent stuff has got to be Band of Brothers, you know, because it, because it feels real, you know, okay, there's one too many well, kind of you know, silhouetted out on a, on a, on a horizon waiting to be well, seen. We had a really, you know, we had a couple of really fortunate reasons why that we are so accurate. Um, reason one was a lot of money. Yeah. You know, I mean, we were given a lot of money to play with. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hired really good people who really cared 
you know. And and truly, and I can't understate this enough, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg really, really, really know about World War II. <laughs> no, no, I'm not joking. Like, I yeah, mean, they, Tom could could sit anybody down and I defy anybody to know more about the war than Tom. And I'm not joking. You know, um, he, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a nut. And so he was always overseeing everything. He wasn't on set the whole time because he was making other things, but he was back and forth a lot and, and things all had to go through the Tom. Okay. And, And he really knew his stuff. Knows, I should say. Um, let's have a look at episode three, Carantan. Uh, Woody, we've already mentioned Blythe. What's the issue with Blythe? Well, it's, it's a, it's a well known mistake, as John said. You know, it's pre internet. And Albert Blythe, who is the sort of focal point for episode three to be shown to be a coward, and then he has the redemption at the end where he leads a patrol and, and, it, um, gets wounded in the neck, and in fact, it was the shoulder. And the episode ends with Malarkey picking up laundry and so on, and then it ends with Cliff and Albert Blythe passed away of his wounds in 1988. Well, of course, we now know he lived on 1967, served in Korea, um, was decorated, and, and it, was a, it was a mistake. But, you know, everyone who's ever written anything or done a TV show, job or bit of tour guide knows we make mistakes. That is just how it goes. And uh, um, I, as an episode, I like episode three. I like I like the story arc. Because to me, by this, the typical King Arthur, Luke Skywalker, it's the young, young, nervous person who, through redemption, becomes the hero. So I, yeah. I, I think it's a classic tale. It's just if you were a Blythe family, you might not see it that way. But that's a well-known, well, you know, you can just search Blythe internet now, and there's a whole raft of sites come up saying this is where they got it wrong. But it's, yeah. it's a mistake. I don't hold it against anybody for that. Um the other thing about episode three is, is the attack on Carrington was a divisional sized attack. And the 327th, 501st, 506th all came in uh, almost simultaneously and took the town. And it does sort of hint that he can be did on its own. But that's the that's the viewer putting that on it. The show is telling the story of a few men. Yeah. The audience can have this guilty part of, of then saying, oh, therefore they must have won the war. But that's not the writing. That's the viewer seeing something that isn't there. And um, and Carrington, you know, was, was a big battle for everybody. You can't show everybody. You can't show the 501st doing their bit. But, you know, it, it's, it's, that's the big mistake in, in episode three is the whole Blythe saga. You've got a lot of respect for episode four replacements, haven't you, that it doesn't attempt to retell a bridge too far? Well, I was just speaking to James about that because James, you know, is a big, big uh, Arnhem guy and Al Murray and, and what have you. And, Episode four is telling the style, the tale of, of Market Garden without in any way telling the tale of Market Garden. It doesn't mention bridges. There's not a bridge in the entire episode. There's barely a mention of the highway. It is simply showing an action uh, in Newnan. And I think it's it's not my favourite episode at all, but I do like the fact they say, hey, yeah, let's just throw that whole bridge out there and we'll ignore it completely. And it just shows the guys in combat. So it's it's an interesting episode, I think. Elena, what's the problem with the head shaving in that episode? Oh yeah, Paul, Paul and I were talking about this earlier <clears throat> about the head shaving, where um, it was more commonly seen in France uh, rather than in Holland. I mean, don't get me wrong, it, it could have happened, but it was more women were were actually humiliated in France for uh, having sex with a German or anything along those lines. But the problem with that as well, these women were sometimes exploited in the sense of oh I'm kind of jealous of that woman I'm going to say she she slept with a with a German or she worked for the Germans so therefore she also has to go through such a a, a embarrassing and humiliating ordeal it's not something they had a lot of time to spend on is it James uh well I but I think it's I think it's completely fine because I think what you're trying to do in that you're trying to again you're trying to give a flavor of the time of the mood and and you know the 101st weren't really in, in France after Normandy and after D-Day but you're trying to show that kind of that response and that experience and what people went through and you know there is absolutely no question that that um 
collaborator, uh, women had their heads shaved, whatever, na- whatever nation they were. Although it's more predominant in France, it did happen elsewhere. Mm. Uh, I just have a memory in my head that that was accurate. I remember seeing a picture at the time of Dutch of this happening. In it the- definitely did happen in Holland. In a much more understated way. It was that the French seemed to take it this sort of really kind of vindictive, um, right. and, you know, blood pouring from sculpts kind of thing. And the Dutch seemed to do it in a far more Dutch kind of way and it was it happened but you know I have no problem with the scene being exaggerated because it conveys something that was a was an issue in World War II and all you know when, when we're trying to come up with mistakes in the show they're not really mistakes they're just saying well I suppose they could have done that slightly better but that's that's you know, that's being nitpicking I mean people could say oh they've got the badge size wrong there that helmet isn't the right shape but, yeah, the, 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 the nitpicking is is really petty but I mean, the other thing is, is Woody, is, is that, that, you know, most people who, who fought through the war will say the only bit of the war they, they actually saw was the one that was kind of 40 yards either side of them. And, and, and in a way that, this is what, this is the perspective that kind of Band of Brothers shows. You know, if, if other people choose to kind of interpret that as the war in capital letters and everyone's experience, that's kind of almost their problem. I mean, you know, what, what yeah. Band of Brothers the book does, what the, what the TV series does, is sets out to show what the experience of one company of 120 men or so, you know, through the war, their experience of the war. Their experience of the war starts on, you know, in training in America, then then combat starts on, on the night of the 6th, you know, the morning of 6th of June, and goes through to May 1945. There's obviously there's huge gaps in that because... That is just their experience, mm. uh, and and I think actually I think you're right. I think the point about about episode four with 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 um, Market Garden, that is the experience of Easy Company. So that's right. absolutely fine. And it was all intended. I mean that it, it, it's not intended to tell you the story of the Western Front. You know that's not what Band of Brothers is about. You know it's it's a story of one infantry group's rather extraordinary adventures just because of the unit, because of the nature of what a paratrooper does, which is front lines, front lines, front lines. So by default, they're going to see more combat than your average Joe, let's say. Uh, but yeah, that's their story, and it's and it's supposed to be their story, nothing bigger. Um, Paul, if you're picking a weak point of the series, you go for episode five, Crossroads, don't you? It's not your favourite. I do the history. I just don't, I don't like the pacing of it myself. I don't like mm. flashback. It, it doesn't work for me. I know that's the Tom Hanks directed episode. I, it, it's not that I don't like it. It is that I like the others more. Yeah. And, uh, I think it, there's also a little bit of that, um, having to rescue the British. Now, of course, there was that mission across the Rhine to rescue people from Armand, but it, it comes across to me as a bit, a little bit. Oh, thank you, thank you, God bless America, thank you very much. A bit, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, that just annoys me a little bit. But it, and also, I think you have no idea of the geography. I mean, John was very lucky with episode two. There's that briefing by Nixon in, in number in episode one about here we're going to go to the beach here. Our drop zone is here, and everyone knows what D Day is. That most of the audience have a rough idea of the plan of D Day. They're breaking it down to what the 101st were doing on the island after Market Garden. It's a much more complicated situation to explain. But I think people watching it are, are not quite sure what they're actually supposed to be doing. You know, the winter's running up the dike a bit. Anyone actually point that on a map who's watching it? Anyone know what the context of that is? That's, that's my only gripe with it. I just don't, it's the one I like the least. James, do you agree? No, I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. I like them all. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I actually, that's one of the ones I particularly do like. I, I just don't think it matters that you're not placed there because it's, it goes back to the point you were just making earlier and that I was um, concurring with Woody that this is the experience of, this is the experience of those guys and, and you're seeing it through their eyes. And I think that's fine. I mean, you know, it, obviously as a Brit, it massively grates that every time Hollywood depicts British people alongside Americans. Americans all look square jawed and with amazing teeth and six foot four and, and they're cool and they have the two days of stubble and their helmets on one side, just like that kind of that GI on the front cover of life and in all We look like Rick Mayo. 
Uh, we all, yeah, we all look like, you know, we, we were all sort of spindly about teeth and, and we always say, we always, they're always depicted with either really bad Cockney accents or kind of as a plums up their ass. And they sort of say, well, I don't know what it's, what you other Yanks are like, but if they're anything like you, we'll soon beat Hitler. And, and this kind of thing is absolutely <laughs> gruesome. Um, uh, and you know, I'm just desperate for a kind of, you know, a British, Band of brothers, you know, you know, we're following a British tank crew from the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry or something. It would just be absolutely amazing. But of course, all the money is in America, and the audience is bigger in America. And if you if you're funding it and writing it, it's 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 your prerogative to put it from your perspective. So you know, we're, you know, we should sort of put up or shut up. I think. Well, let's crowdfund it. We have, what do we need to get to? About half a billion <laughs> to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> we can ring Colonel Tom and see if he'll walk round his garden for us. <laughs> God love him. Love Happy one hundredth birthday. Um yeah, a stone yeah. convert conversely, number six, we're talking about one that, that maybe is a little bit less exciting. Uh, Bastone, that episode really is top notch, isn't it? And I personally I don't think you needed to do the little hint of romance with Rene Le Maire, which of course is not historically accurate, but I have no problem that they did it. I think um, for that reason, there's a reason that everyone loves Shane Taylor and Doc Rowe. And it's because of that human episode, I think. I don't know if you guys agree. Uh, I think it's an absolutely terrific episode, but if I'm completely honest, I actually prefer the one that follows a little bit more. There's uh, my, one of my favourite scenes in the whole series is 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 Ronnie Spears kind of hurtling across the open space. Oh, I, I, I would say oh, it's the fantastic. best. It's the best five minutes of the show. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's certainly right up there. It's 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 terrific. Pretty and, much all yeah. of the actors went for episode seven, didn't they, Paul? And Rick Gomez said in all the filming. The bit he was a nine-year-old boy was behind the haystack when Ron Spears runs in behind. So we were all just nine-year-old boys playing war in our garden at that moment. And, uh, right. yeah, great, great five minutes. The interesting thing, I'm going to sound really, really sexist, Alina and Alex, and I'm very sorry for this, but as a tour guide who's taken lots of Band of Brothers fans, episode six was the one where husbands had started watching it from episode one and the wives had, had kind of moved in and sat down when episode six started. Now, that sounds really awful. I've heard that <laughs> so many times. Yeah, Mag, you're was, sitting next to him, down. slap him for us. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. I think it was seen, oh, it's another war show. It's going to be Guns of Navrone or Dirty Dozen. Of course, it's much more than that. And the amount yep. of times the actors and I, we've met the fans, they've come along and the, the wife has said, or the grandmother said, it was episode six where I sat down and watched it, and then I went back and rewatched it all from the beginning. So I don't think I don't think it, episode six is John's favourite. It's not my favourite as a as a as a way in for people who aren't war buffs. I think it was. That's both. a really really good point. I think, and it is one of the favourite episodes. If, you know, if you widen the poll to non-military people or people involved in the show, I actually think it might be the favourite episode uh, for that same reason just it's the easiest to access to access rather because of the love interest you know mm. um but yeah you know it's it's uh, uh, yeah yeah so I, ad- I like episode seven more as well yeah, yeah the I think episode seven, love personally, breaking point. for me uh, episode seven i think is the best episode of the show also because it really just encapsulates the idea of band of brothers you know the brotherhood of men and what is leadership and just that fucking amazing sequence. It's just, to me, it's, it's my favorite. I did. I, do you know, Alina and I were both young teenagers when it came out and uh, we were, we were both, we didn't know each other. We were very hormonal. We pretty much fell in love with everybody that was in it. But um Spears, Matt Settle on that bit. Wow. I was gone. I don't know about Alina. But yeah. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we were not really discriminating. I think I was about 14, 15 and pretty much loved all of them. But yeah, um, that episode I do love. James, what about you? Episode seven, Breaking Point. Oh yeah. No, it's, 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 it's my second favorite after, after Day of Days. I mean, I, I, I you know, don't take this the wrong way, John, with episode oh. nine. I mean, I just, it's, I, I just think for all the reasons that you've just said, I, I think it's just. Yeah. An absolutely terrific one. And also I've been there and I know that part of the world and, you know, I've been sat, walked through foyer and I've seen those fields and, you know, I have no idea where he filmed it, but it was probably in Hertfordshire, but it, but it, 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 it just, 
it feels right. I mean, it, it looks right. It looks like it does out there. I mean, when you when you go to Foy and when you go to those woods and all the rest of it, that is exactly what it looks like. I mean, right. it really isn't very different at all. So I thought that was incredibly atmospheric. Well, one of the things that I, uh, as much as I love episode seven, I think it, it, I lose a point for it as my favorite. Ep- I mean, it is my favorite episode, but I, I have an asterisk with the fact that poor uh, Dyke is represented in a way that's, shall we say, less nuanced than the reality of the situation. It's done for a reason. Um, it's, yeah. But it, it's, it, it's done for a story reason more than a history reason. Yeah. To, to, to show the vacuum of leadership for Spears to fill. That's the dramatic reason to up up, to up Spears' entrance. I mean, for the listeners. The whole episode is trying to also discuss the idea of leadership. I mean, for the listeners who aren't aware, um, Dyke's story, he received a bronze star in the Netherlands, in Holland, and he received a second one in the Ardennes about a week before the incident in Foy happened. And it was for pulling out men under, under fire. You know, it was for bravery. And... Nancy Lyle, who was further to and said that when the attack on Foy went in, um, I was wounded in the shoulder. And his, his, his reason for pushing on was more because he was wounded than he was, he was suffering, um, mentally. But of course, as, as you both said, it, it drove that plot forward. But I want to relate a story quickly. I, so I spent some time with Pete O'Meara a couple of years ago who played Dyke. Yeah, he's he went great. for the role of Spears. He went for the role of Spears and apparently got through the last two and said, yeah, you're not getting Spears. Matt Settle's getting Spears, but we'll give you the secondary role of Dyke. And he nearly didn't take it. And in the end, he did. And um, he had done some touring with me and Norman, a couple other guys did, been to Omaha Beach, seen some uh, where Jimmy Monteith earned the Medal of Honor, various other places like that. And it was late one night in Norman. We'd, had, we'd all had a few, few sherbets. And, and um, Pete said, I wonder how many of us here would like to be judged forever by history by the worst day of our careers and how many would like to be judged by the consistent effort we've put in over Korea. And we all went, wow, that's a really profound moment because whatever happened to Dyke that day, and they're very, as John so eloquently said, is there's, it's a nuanced story. It wasn't a good day for Dyke. You know, it, and, and Winters had a great day on June the 6th. And yet if you read between the lines and John knew Dick, Dick had his own moments on June the 6th where he wondered whether he would be able to carry on and do it. And, 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 and it just made me think, at any point during an act of bravery, is there a moment where that guy goes, I can't do this? Right. And they do find the strength. And it was something very profound that Pete said. It, 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 I use it a lot on my talk. You know, the, the difference between bravery and, I'm going to use the word cowardice, is a very, very fine line. And uh, I, I, yeah, poor old Dyke is a casualty in, in, literally and figuratively of that episode. But of course, it, you know, as the, the actors said, when Spears runs down the slope, uh, you know, every, everybody is watching it going, save us, save us. It's an amazing bit of television. It's interesting how we're, we're, we're coming to this conclusion that maybe the best moment in the series is based on a foundation of stretching the truth a little bit, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Ronald Spears is just such an interesting character because, of course, he didn't get involved and he wouldn't. And it's very interesting when you look at the kind of correspondence between Dick Winters and, and Ronald Spears in uh, in the 1990s, where Dick Winters is is trying to persuade him to come on board and get involved. And he just says, "I just don't want to." I that was then. Oh, you've seen I, the you've seen the uh, letters. Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, and oh, fast- I've never seen the letters. I just knew. Oh, I mean, Dick and I would talk about Spears obviously a lot, yeah. and I would just hear, "No, he still won't talk to you. No, he still yeah. won't talk to you." No, so what's really interesting, what he keeps saying in the letters over and over, there's about I can't remember how many. Are. Let's let's say five hundred cents, half a dozen of them. Um, what he keeps saying is, how do we do what we did though then? You know, I, you know and there's another one, he goes, Dick, you know, you, it, it's, it's caused me to think about those days a lot. And I've been thinking about it all. And I, and I just keep wondering, how the hell do we do it? How yeah. do we do it? It was just terrifying. And, and you know, and it was so at odds to the character that he was, that he's depicted as mm-hmm. in the film, which by, by all accounts, I understand was pretty accurate as people remembered him i mean that is what he seemed like and and it just goes to show that these ice men you think they're all ice men but actually they're not they've got the same concerns and anxieties and you know troubles with fear and and how to kind of suppress your fear and make you know i i i I would would disagree with you slightly well you know more Um, than me well no only in, in the case of dick winters dick is a 
he was a he was a he was a tough cookie. He was what you saw yeah. is what you got. You know. Yeah, the other thing from his letters, though, is quite interesting because he also had this pen pal, this female pen pal back in the states who he wrote to a lot. And then, <laughs> and when you read those letters. Um, there's a real vanity there that you, because you always just, everyone just assumes that he's this wonderful, sagacious guy. He's humble. Who? Dick Winters. But, but, oh. but in the letter, the letters with this, this pen pal are much younger, more ambitious, kind of less modest guy uh, appears in these letters, which is entirely natural from a, from a 20 something, but, but it's just interesting. I think one thing that our listeners are going to... That guy in his 70s, too, and 80s. Okay, well, that's great to hear. I mean, he had a very healthy ego, well-deserved right. one. Yes. But it, trust me, it, it did not... It was, it was very stiff. I have often said I would not want to have been a child of Dick Winter's. I am right. much happier having been a friend and colleague or whatever the fuck you want to call me. You yeah. know, um, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you this story um, without naming names. So when I was writing the D-Day episode um, and, you know, I talked to Dick a lot. That was the most important episode for the series for Dick was episode two. That was cool. the single defining moment of his life, you know. And um, I, I can't underscore the importance of that day to his self-image, to everything that followed. Um, and so we spoke a lot about it and, and um, way more than I did with the other guys. And I, I asked him at a certain point, I said, you know, why did you, where did you find the energy and, and, and why did you, managed to march in the middle of the night those miles to get to your assignment when a lot of your uh, mates, a lot of your friends just dug trench, you know, foxholes where they landed. And what made you do what you did as opposed to other members of Easy who just sat where they were and dug a foxhole? And we, and I, I, I mentioned two men in particular by name who had done that. And he looked at me and without blinking, he said, and I never gave those two men an important assignment for the rest of the war. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he, he really was a guy, wasn't he? Amazing. You cannot, and, and he wasn't fucking around. He never trusted those two guys for the rest of the war. Mm. You know, um, he was a tough character. So, Paul, um, yeah. with regards to accuracy, uh, or not even accuracy, but with interpretation, the Hubler story isn't bang on historical, is it? But you think it's important to be that it's in there? Well, it's one of those odd ones. I mean... Some people remember it happening. Some people don't remember it happening. I mean, he definitely died of an accidental injury. Whether it was with a Luger, whether it was with an American pistol, some remember it, some don't. But I think, uh, I don't know why it got inserted in the episode, and that's not one of John. But to me, it was very important because I think everyone wants to think their relative died in the war, running over the hill, killing mm -hmm. the enemy machine gun team, saving yeah. the day. And of course, the reality is that's not how everyone died. It's one of the reasons, interestingly, why the notification letters most of the men got were very vague about what happened to them. Because if you put in one letter, oh, and Ivor Smith was a hero because he ran across and he knocked out of a tank with a grenade, the guy who died accidentally, like Hubler did, with a discharge or a pistol in his pocket, what do you do? You put that in the note as well? You say, well, he died of an accident. So you just keep everything vague. Yeah. You say they died in the service of their country. And to me, that's why that works so well. And it's also a very deliberately slowed down scene. You know, you want, I was talking to lean of the staff noon, you're watching it and it's like watching, um, medic die in Seven Pride Ryan. It's mm -hmm. drawn out very long. You kind of, each time you watch it, you think, I hope he doesn't die. And you know, he's going to, and he dies. And he looks at his, his friends and they look at him and it's the helplessness. And I wonder, John, interestingly, was it easier? It must have been easier writing 
less of characters later in the show than it was earlier in the show because um, you got to know people. You know, when you're introducing all the action, when people haven't really got to know anybody yet. Yeah, you know, but but we had in a way, you know, we had, we were so immersed in the project by that point that everything was really hard to write, you know, in the beginning or later, you know, it was hard. And I don't know, that's a Graham episode, and I don't know uh, his exact, it was always like that in the script, though. I remember getting the, the first script of that episode, and it was just like that as well, who was I- that. I think uh, episode eight we've kind of touched on um, in terms of the Webster speaking German. And you mentioned that that is perhaps one where you can see um, the the lack of collaboration, the fact that you were all remotely writing these episodes. We do have to come on to episode nine. And I know Alina is going to have questions, but let me kick off because um, why we fight is the, apart from the baseball scene at the end of 10, which I've never watched again since watching it once. Um, I've watched <laughs> nine and a half episodes repeatedly. Um, number nine is gut wrenching. How do you go about writing that, and where do you start with something where the dialogue is not worth a damn? The dialogue means nothing. That's not what's going to make this episode. Um, well, it was really hard to write. It was really, 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 really hard to write um, for multiple reasons. Um, and it, it was an evolution because, as I said, there wasn't – whatever that had been in that 13-episode binder, I don't have any idea what was in it about the concentration camp. And But but when Tom asked me to write that episode, I mean, I immediately felt, oh, there's a slightly larger responsibility here than just Easy Company, which is its own giant responsibility. So I, again, you know, I would call up um, the guys, Lipton, Compton, you know, and say, tell me about Landsberg. And they would say, oh, no, 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 I, I, I can't talk about it. It's too, it was really horrible. It's, I, I never want to talk about it. I can't talk about it. And that happened over and over and over until I got to Dick. And, and, and Winters could talk to me about it. Um, and in the process of me talking to Dick about it, um, he told me a couple of stories. And at the same time, uh, when I had written episode two, that whole bit with, and then I saw the dailies, you know, the, the, the footage of the scenes being shot. And I still hadn't written episode nine yet. And I saw Ron Livingston do that bit with the can opener and the can. And he says to Winters, don't ever get a cat. That was, that was a bit of ad lib. He, he made that up. And I was like, oh, I've got to write episode nine about him, about, about Nixon. Mm-hmm. So in talking to, to Dick, I said, A, do you mind if I make this episode about Nixon and not you? And, and, and B, you know, what were you guys thinking about the war as a whole at that point? And that's what the episode became about um, in a lot of ways. Um, why are they there? What have they been doing? You know, was it all worth it? And then this idea that I had pretty early on that we don't get to the constant, when we get to the concentration camp, we should be as unexpecting of it as we possibly can be so that we too as an audience, are surprised, um, which I think is one of the things that works really well in the episode. Did you um, know that the actors all declined to see the set before they filmed it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we also had a fantastic director, David Frankel, who also directed episode seven. Um, my, I, I, two of the better episodes, seven and nine. I think everybody agrees. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I, I really poured my heart into that it's about a lot of things it's about evil it's about about culture and it's about you know so much Um, because it has these broad important responsible themes could you afford therefore to be less historically accurate with that one well it was as i said it was almost by necessity because nobody would really tell me anything about it so 
So in a sense, the assignment to me was, well, you need to write an episode that covers, you know, late April to early May of 45. That's it. That that was the, there was not, you know, and make sure that the concentration camp is in it. So that, that was that all was they my, said with regards to it. Yeah, that was my, that was it. So I then said, well, how can I use the concentrate kind of backwards building? Okay. The concentration camp is the answer. What's the question? What are we doing here? You know? Um, and so it was sort of a backwards engineered. And then the personal story of Nixon, um, you know, having his own sort of doubts that are answered by the concentration camp. Once I decided on that story, um, I talked a lot to Dick about what Nixon was doing at that time, what he was like at that time. And the story of Nixon going into the house with the barking dog, right? The German Frau Lai, a Frau's yeah. house. And, um, that actually happened to Winters. Okay. Not Nixon. So, so Winters had that exact experience where he walked into this house. It was clearly an upper class German house. He was shamed silently to exit the, the house. And, um, and then I made up the payoff of seeing the woman in the concentration camp. So that's a, a fictional. Yeah. Pay- um, so there's a lot of fiction in there, right? So the fiction being Nixon having this experience, not Winters, um, and, and, and the Nixon arc. I mean, I don't know how Nixon really felt when he saw the concentration camp. Neither did his widow. Grace, his widow, uh, was did not know him until the 60s. Um, uh-huh. So I had no idea uh, what was really going on. Now, a lot of that episode I also grabbed from Webster's book. Um, uh, there's beats in there because Webster went into detail about this time period a little bit more than other people did, right? So, for example, the ducks um, and the, the, the Frenchman shooting the surrendering Germans, that came from Webb's book. Um, he mentioned that. And I wanted to show the moral grayness of war. You know, mm-hmm. Spears is a thief and a pretty bald thief. And, and in fact, we cut out some of his bad behavior out of episode nine. Yeah. And there's a little bit more of, of Spears being jerky to German civilians, but it was meant to say, Hey, there's jerky. And then there's Holocaust. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, I mean, it, so, is yeah. a, it is a beautiful, harrow, harrowing but beautiful tribute, I think, to the guys that walked around the corner and did liberate these camps and did see that. Um, right. As far as you can do it for television. Um, Alina, as a concentration camp historian um, who was – largely does what she does because of episode nine. Have you got anything you want to ask, John? Actually, I just first of all want to say I've always watched episode nine. Um, I was talking to Woody about this, um, Paul, the other um, earlier, that I've always viewed it as a viewer. And for the first time last week, I actually sat down and looked at it from the concentration camp historian perspective. And I've really got to say, really good job. <laughs> Thanks. For someone, and listening to you now, for someone who had very little information, that is, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I'm, uh, there's a couple of small comments that I want to make, for example, um, including everybody, because my biggest issue with my research is that I have to acknowledge everybody. I don't just acknowledge, for example, um, the Jews that were murdered or the Soviets or the Poles. You, found a line with Liebgott where you could include everyone. And I absolutely love it. It's just, it's such a beautiful moment. Harrowing, very harrowing, and very dark. Yeah. But you've managed to encumber everything just in that one line. Thank you. Really, you know, a lot of people don't pick up on that line. Because mm. it's, it's a translated line. 
I love that. You use the words because you use two words in that. You use unwanted and disliked. Right. And that's what they were. They were unwanted and they were disliked. So anybody who's listening, go back to that episode and listen to that line. It is just, it is just so powerful and incredible. Thank you. And it was purposeful, you know. There's, there's other things I love about the episode. For example, uh, well, I don't love it. It's actually really painful to watch when um, Liebgott has to tell the prisoners that they're withdrawing the food. Yeah. Um, that is incredibly, it's, it's painful. And, and watching the pain on his face is just, it's, it's horrible. But that is, that is exactly what happened. I mean, you couldn't give prisoners food in, in such large amounts. I mean, for example, in Auschwitz, they were giving them teaspoons. Mm. Every cup, every once in a while, they would have a teaspoon or a tablespoon of mashed potato. That is all these people could take. Otherwise, they would be dying. Mm. They'd be dying in droves. They were, they were starving. What I admire most about that episode is that that's something that Spielberg had more than three hours to convey in Schindler's List um, that you managed to do in an hour of television, which is pretty incredible to get that much power and that much feeling and to to nail it like that um, without well, really, all those hours to put it in context. Um, it was, was really nerve-wracking yeah. writing it because um, I was a very new screenwriter, actually. Um, this was the beginning of my career. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, remember, I had been asked to write the D-Day episode two years after Saving Private Ryan came out. Yeah. And then I was asked to write the concentration camp episode five years after Schindler's List came out. And I was the least experienced writer on the project. But someone then knew what they were doing because they picked the right guy for both those episodes. But anyway, I wrote the episode and I went into Spielberg and I was just scared as scared can be. And Tom called me up and, and said that Stephen had read it and he had broken down in tears. And don't change a word. And you actually captured one of the worst sub camps of the hull. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was the worst sub camp. The conditions were, were just unimaginable. I mean, the closest you can compare it to would be Auschwitz. Right. Right. And that is saying something. So for yeah. me, that's just, it's a very good job. So thank you. Well, thank you. I will tell you this when, when um, somewhere back here is a, is a letter actually from, from Dick to me and he mentions episode nine Um because he was also amazed how accurate that particular sequence was, even to the degree uh, with the nuns with the odd habit. Yep. Um, I, I some, I had seen a picture of it at some point, I guess, and wrote that into the script, and it made it into the show. And Dick was just mentioning how I remember those hats in those habits you got it so right and the other thing i always remember about i had a conversation with with dick when i was writing episode nine and i think it's 99 roughly maybe 2000 and it's just when um holocaust denialism is really starting to to gain momentum you know um uh and it really angered Winters. It Holocaust denialism really angered him. And I can still remember in my head his voice telling me, I was there. It happened. And him just going on and on and on mm. uh, about Holocaust denialism. Is there um, anything in your two episodes, um, both of which are, I think with episode seven are the three standout for me, um, of the whole series, is there anything that didn't make it into two or nine that broke your heart as a writer? Yeah, well, two, not so much. Two, two um, is pretty much what it is. Nine, there's actually about 10 more minutes. So these are the 10 minutes that were shot and were cut because they were deemed too much. Correct. In the camp. Yeah. Um, there was more, there was eight or nine. I can't remember exactly. Eight minutes, nine minutes more of, of really dark shit in the camp. Yeah. And that was the only time that I was aware of where HBO actually stepped in because pretty much Tom and Steven had 
could be able to do whatever they wanted roughly. Um, but with this, HBO is like, it's a little too much. And it yeah. was already a long episode, you know, but so it was clocking in at like an hour 10, I think. Yeah. And so they trim 10 minutes. But I, I do have to say, if you think it's gut wrenching, gut wrenching now, it was really hard with the extra 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, let's briefly touch on episode 10, Woody. Um, just to say that, I mean, it, to me, it's back to something that's done, um, artistically. Uh, the end of the war, you said, was announced when they were back in France, not Austria, but they chose to put it in Austria. Um, and, yeah, uh, yeah, I can completely see why. I mean, you yeah. know, finishing it in a dreary French town uh, would have not had the impact of finishing it in the Alps. And yeah. Um, yeah, so it was a necessary um, decision. But um, I find episode 10 a bit disjointed. They're, they're trying to tie up all the loose ends and it it, it, it nearly works. And uh, I have American friends who say they cannot stand watching those British guys play baseball because they're, they're not swinging the bat <laughs> and doing everything properly. I say, I don't care. I mean, it's, but <laughs> apparently that's something Americans notice. So you can tell who the Brits are. <laughs> yeah. 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 John, um, I got to ask, do you know who made the call? Because it, for me, is a stroke of absolute genius to not display the names of any of those veterans until episode 10. I am not a hundred percent sure, but I am ninety percent sure that was Tom Hanks because I I can tell you that it was Tom. So so those interviews were not originally going to be in the show at all. That was yeah. a last minute decision. The episodes had already been cut, sweetened, mixed, sound effects, everything, and those interviews were part of a different project, a, a documentary that was being made at the same time called We Stand Alone Together. Yeah. And so those interviews were made, A, as uh, pieces for that show, and B, as research for our show. Um, and then Tom, at a certain point, said, I want to, you know, put these in the beginning. And all the writers uh, stupidly thought that was a terrible idea because mm. we thought – it would make everything that came after. So if you start with five minutes of interviews of the real guys, then you see 50 minutes of actors in costumes. It will accentuate the fact that this is not a real story. That's what we thought. Yeah. Obviously we were wrong. People love it. It is fantastic. And I'm pretty sure it was Tom's idea to not show the names. Yeah, because that's the exact reason that I have never been able to watch it a second time, because every time a name came up, I was gone. I was in pieces, absolute pieces, because you have lived through (laughs) nine episodes with these guys, and you have got to know them, and you are rooting for every single one of them to survive. And when the names start popping up and you start realising who is who, I remember um, the first time Dick Winter's name came up, I was sobbing like an absolute wreck the way i have yeah. never sobbed at anything before or since so whoever thought of that if it was tom hanks or anyone else, sure it was a stroke tom. of genius um band of brothers overall the positives obviously uh it is 10 episodes of outstanding television um without even taking into account that it's telling the story of real guys. Uh, it kick-started a whole new generation of historians. It showed the brutality of war to a complete cross-section of the general public, kids, grandmothers, not just history buffs. Um, negatives, people are overly weighted to being interested, perhaps in the 101st Airborne now, but then I, I think you were telling the story of one unit that had to happen people go to Bastogne but they don't know about other things that happen in the Battle of the Bulge same in Normandy um the wake of follow-up books documentaries art prints merchandise um why can't Lance Nielsen get his Pegasus Bridge movie made as a note that Paul's made what do you see as the these these are basically Paul's that I've read out uh the the positives and the negatives of Band of Brothers I think the Positives are how it shows people what these people did, what they really did, what they sacrificed, what, what, what it cost to, to end fascism, um, and authoritarianism at that moment in time. Um, you know, in terms of the negatives, um, you know, it's, I worry sometimes that it, it, it's a little bit too glorifying 
Um, that scares, you know, I know a lot of people went into the army, into the U.S. army because of band. Yeah. And my son was thinking about joining the Navy and, you know, but, but that's, you know, it's a heavy thing. It's heavy. We talked to some of the actors who have sort of had people say to them, I joined because of you. But this, I think it's important. Um, do you think that the release of the show and the fact that it coincided near dead on with 9-11, I yeah. don't think you can take it all on your shoulders. It may have no. been a factor, but I Absolutely. think that is something else looming large in the background that was Absolutely. perhaps driving. And I would actually argue it's one of the reasons Band was so successful. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about Band was uh, it was not successful on HBO as much as it was hoped to have been, meaning HBO had very big hopes for it. The first episode had huge ratings, and then obviously two days later, 9-11 happened, and nobody wanted to watch a movie of young Americans dying in bloody ways. Yeah. What that meant was a year later, when it went out on DVD, and uh, the war in Afghanistan and Iraq had started to take off in 0203 band suddenly not suddenly but but really exploded um sort of um, in the secondary market more than it did when it was first on hbo and um, paul as a historian you're taking someone around normandy who's obsessed with band of brothers and wants to see all the sites from the series where you and you can take him to one place and go this isn't in it but you need to see this where we where do you take them that's not easy to answer, really, because it's not like there's one place. It's just you show them the e-company site, and then you just show all the other sites that are equally important. You know, Brecor was one of four gun batteries overlooking Utah Beach. So it, it's not really one site. Um, yeah. It's just it's spreading things out. But I think, just to add about the neg- negatives, I think what's very very um, revealing these days is the negatives are coming to an end, because John will know, because he knew some of the guys, post-show, reunions became a little bit hijacked by the general public in what began as kind of a fascinating way and then a couple of years down the line the people turning up for autographs and to meet the guys got a bit um, unwieldy the reunions they lost a bit of um, possession of them and, and yet that's now come full circle because although the veterans have mostly passed on the kids have now reclaimed those as what they always should have been just for the people who are actually connected with it I think the same thing with the, hist- the people who thought that the 101st Airborne won the war and that Dick Winters was the best soldier of World War II. The people who've stuck with it, they are now reading outside of it. They, they're, they're, they've read all the Easy Company books now. They've read the Malarkey book and the Bill Garnier book, and they're now stepping sideways in the 82nd and the first Canadian parachute plan. So I think the negatives did definitely happen, but I think they have they've kind of run their course now. And I think with it being the 20th anniversary coming up, I think we can now look back at it again as the great thing it was. And you know, I can list off a, 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 a bunch of historians in their 30s who are like you two, you two girls. You know, you were teenagers when it came out. Now you're writing about the war. Mm. And uh, I could list off a huge great, you know, as long as my arm about those people. I, comics got me in, comics and war movies. I'm older than so I think the negatives, they were there, but I think they have, they've now receded now. And um, it's, it's so lovely to speak to the family members and realise they've now reclaimed those those reunions because that was something no one could predict. No one could have predicted that the veterans were absolutely bombarded by fan mail. I mean, one will know there's trucks of letters turning up to Dick Winters and the other guys. Some of the vets went into financial difficulties trying to respond to all that stuff. And the actors, you know, they, they were sent HBO standard 10 by 8 headshots to send back to fans. They, they, were, they got 500 each. Of them. The, act, the veterans didn't. Yeah. It's not HBO's fault or anything. It just that this thing hit globally in a way that no one could have predicted. And some of the veterans dealt with it incredibly well. Bill Garnier just embraced the whole thing and loved speaking to people. And others didn't kind of embrace it so well. But that's no one's fault. No one could have predicted this huge wake followed that show and um you know it's it, the legacy is just so important and uh it, yeah as i say it's come full circle now so i think that's important we can look back at it as what an amazing thing it was john have you done anything since um i know you're working on something very special now but have you done anything since that's that's been out that you are prouder of than band of brothers no oh gosh no and and i i 
you know, I am working on on Masters of the Air, which is sort of the follow up to Band, um, the third one um, after the Pacific, and it's about the air war and and um, the U.S. Army Air Force um, bombing, daylight bombing of Germany. So I'm getting to do it again, um, which is really, really fortunate. Um, But I have to tell you, for me, I don't think I will ever write anything as important as, at least in my work, as episode nine of Band of Brothers. That has had a larger impact, even than the series in some ways. I mean, I have um, friends who, who work for various Holocaust museums and, you know, they tell me how that, that, that episode has a much, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like a, like an arrogant person, but, but, no, you but, don't. but, but a lot of people learn about the Holocaust from that episode. I, I think been, you weren't wrong when you said that there was a high responsibility in writing that episode and you stepped yeah. up. And I think that, yeah, that is yeah. the fact that you stepped up. That's not being arrogant. That's, it's a fact um, that I think no one can say that you, you mistimed it, got it wrong, didn't hit the mark. You absolutely did. So I don't think it's arrogant at all to say that it has a and higher Masters meaning. It's going to be amazing and, and amazing, but we're not going to explore that. So, yeah. so I won't have that opportunity and it doesn't need to be done because we explored it in band. We're, ex- yeah. we're exploring other things in masters, but um, I don't think I will ever be prouder of anything I write in my life than that one hour. Paul, James, John, thank you so much for joining us to kick off Bob Fist to celebrate Band of Brothers. And I think it's been an amazing start to get such insight, um, not only into the history, but it's been fascinating to get an insight from one of the writers into how you put together two really crucial episodes. And I know it means a lot to Alina to have talked to the person that basically dragged her down the road that she is now on. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was really a pleasure and I really enjoyed the questions. Join us tomorrow when Bob Fest continues. We will be uh, carrying on with our tribute to Band of Brothers by talking to the Easy Kids. That's the descendants of uh, the likes of Bill Garnier and Doc Rowe uh, and the children and grandchildren of the men immortalised in the series. And then on Monday, it's the big one. It's the cast reunion. It's uh, Alina and I um, and Paul trying to wrangle excitable actors while they recall filming the series. Um, thoughts, feelings, events Uh, there's some hilarious stuff in there and it's very poignant and even sad stuff as well as they remember what it meant to them and their careers so don't miss it There now follows a public service announcement I'm Horatia Hornblower and I'm Archie Kennedy the simplest gift you can give in these troubled times is to obey orders Indeed The regulations are very clear in the matter It is the duty of all of us to remain at anchor into the little people in the talking box signal you otherwise. You don't want to end up getting flogged. Good day to you. Good day to you, Brian.